Okay, uh, again, good morning, everyone. And uh, before we start the, the session, let me just see if I can uh, make the lights not to be on in front of the screen. Probably second one will do that. No? Okay, uh, I'm gonna do it like this. I know you're gonna, I'm gonna put you in sleep like this, but problem is that then this is gonna have light on it and it's gonna look bad. Are we okay now? Are we all awake? All right. So, uh, say I, so I don't think I want this. Let me just bring it over here and uh, go home. So uh, I'll go to, um, let me pause for a second. So I'm going to go to my GitHub. So this is my GitHub. And I'll go to my repositories. OK. And I'm going to create a new, this is my school thingy repository. So ignore all the things that you see that are not important. I'm going to create a new repository like you, as you did. Call it OP244Works. Oh, OP244 works, and uh, it has to be pop, uh, pr private, add the readme file exactly like you did, uh, add the C++ schmiggly dinghy over here and create the repository, right? That's what you did, all right? And then I'm going to clone it on my computer so I can start working in it. SSH keys and stuff are created, so I'm going to click over here and start cloning it. So I'll go to a directory. Let's say in uh, OP244, and I'm going to create a directory called here demo. So demo. So in here, I'm going to clone my repository. So I'm going to go over here and say git clone. You have 11, so you have more menus I have to go through, but it's essentially the same. So that is created over here. Now I want to start working on workshops. To start working on workshops, what you do, you go to school's OP244 thingy that we have, OP244 organization, you go to OP workshops, and you clone that one. This is Fardad's repository. You are not allowed to change this. This is a read-only repository. Of course, when you clone it, you can change it on your computer, but you cannot push it. Problem is that if you start changing it on your computer, when you want to pull, if I change any files that you have changed it on your computer, Git's going to stop. Tells you, hey, you are trying to pull something that your current repository has changed it. So if I pull it, I'm going to overwrite your changes. Make sure you merge it so it becomes technical and difficult. So do not modify my repositories. The one that you get from GitHub, do not modify it. Only Clone it on your computer so you have it, and then you do this. So in here, I'm going to clone this, clone the workshops repository, copy. Then come over here beside, right beside my OP244 workshops, and I'm going to clone the, 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 the workshops, the OP244 workshops. Then I'll go into OP244 workshops because Fardat said used my git ignore, not your own. I'll copy this one and the workshop. I'm going to copy these two. Now I'm going to go back to my own repository. I'll paste it over there. So now a repository is not copied, but only a directory of the repository is in here. So that is yours now. Start editing it, push, do all the good stuff that you're supposed to do, and start working on it. So as soon as I do this, I'm going to come right up and go over here, right click, and I'll go git commit. I'm going to say all, which means select everything, add everything. If you are on Mac, you have to say git add star hit enter. So it means add everything. Okay. And then in here, I'm going to add the comment for it. So the now it's commit. If you are on Mac or Linux, you have to say git commit dash M. Then you put the uh, message in front of it. In here, I'm putting the message in GUI. So I'm going to say starting to work, if I can type, 
workshop one. Okay, and uh, updated git ignore because that's what I did too, right? I did two things. So now I'm going to click on commit. It's going to say now this means after it's done, it means now it is committed and being watched by git on your computer. As soon as you commit, you're, and you can come back to it later on. Okay, now I want these changes to be synced upstream. So I want to send it up. So I push it up and it's ready over here. So this push on Mac and Linux, you have to say git push and hit enter. And it pushes it up. Okay, so I'm going to go push and okay. And now everything's up in my workshops and ready to work. So if I, if I open this, now I have workshop, I have lab, I have readme, I have everything that I have, and I can actually start working. So open this lab and start working on it. Do not modify, whoopsie daisy, where did I go? Do, too far back, demo, demo, was I? Oh, thank you very much, much appreciated. <laughs> and, uh, there you go. Okay, yeah, there you go. Okay, so observant. Thank you very much. So if I go to OP Workshop, I do not ever touch this. I just get stuff from it. And just to see if there is any update, every now as soon as you come to start, you just right click over here and you, you go toward this get pull. It means get everything from there. So it only gets the changes from over there. If I made some modifications or anything, as soon as you do pull, Take a look at the message that it gives you. If the message says everything's up to date, it means nothing's changed. But if you see something in here, you have to pay attention. Oh, something's changed. I need to know what, okay? So, yes. It, it, down. It, Let's, copying is correct, but let's uh, uh, use the correct terminology for it, okay? So in Git, you don't copy, you clone. First, you clone, only first time. Then you start pulling. Pull means uh, download, download changes, okay? First, you copy. So first you, first, you download everything to workshops. Then out of this workshops, you copy the stuff you want to work on in your own repository, because this is Fardad's, this is yours. You put it in that one, you start working on the copy that you have, but you never change OP244 works. If you want to see workshop two is coming up, or maybe, maybe I go to workshops, let me demonstrate. So say I go to workshops, so I mean, OP, this is OP244 workshops, right? It's Fardad's, right? I go over here and I take a look at workshop one, and I look at the readme file, and I see something is wrong in here, okay? Let me see what I can change over here without doing anything bad. Um, so in here, I'm going to say uh, replace, oh, let, I can just edit it. I can click on edit over here, and, and give me some error that I can, what does it say? You are allowed to submit. See, it was you. It's wrong. I have to make it your workshop, right? So you're allowed to submit your workshop after the due date. So I fix these things. Except, okay, got it? So I change these things. Now I'm going to submit. How do I submit from here? I usually do it on my computer. Okay, there you go. Commit changes, I'm gonna say fix some typos. Commit changes, right? Now that it's committed, you are at your com computer, you are just want to start working on workshop, you right click over here, you say tortoise git, you do pull. And as soon as you do pull, you see some messages came up. Read me file over here, it says it changed. What you need to do, you close it, you right click on OP244 workshops, you go to Tortoise, say, get, you say show log. It shows that it says fix some typos. And when you click on every and each, down here it tells you what has changed. You double click on that and it tells you what it was and now what it is. 
So it actually fixes them. It shows you what was uh, wrong that was fixed. Got it? Are we okay? So I actually, I, oh my God, I, I made, <laughs> I, I actually screwed something up over this. I have to fix it. Back to what it was. So I fixed some typos and ruined some few things. So, but um, it, it's easy for me. I can just, uh, what I will do over here, I'm going to go, th th the reason that I'm telling you the Git is good is this. I'm just going to come over here and I'm going to go to uh, uh, 2237, I think. Anyways, I'll fix it later. Don't worry. I don't want to waste your time. But I can simply go fix it and well, we'll be done. Okay? So that's that. Uh, where did I? Now I cannot let it go. So wait, give me a second. Where did I put that? There you go. If the file contains, okay. I'll fix the rest later. But anyway, so that was that. So are we good? So now we have some kind of an idea of how things work, right? All right, so good. So that question came up and just had to fix it before we start. So now, good morning, everyone. <laughs> We're going to start our session. OK? Uh, the lady over here has the talking stick. You know what it, how it works, right? As soon as I ask the question, this lady is going to answer it and give the, the, the mic to the next person. And it keeps going like that until it gets to the end. Then it comes back forward, OK? It's full. And if you don't want to answer, you simply say pass. Or not, don't say pass. Just give it to the next person. All right. <laughs> She's so happy. OK, that's what I'm going to do right now. <laughs> All right. Before we start, you know workshop one is up. <laughs> you just saw. OK, uh, start doing workshop one. Come with questions to the lab. OK, and if you have any questions, like what, while you're doing it, you're in trouble and you want help, uh, simply book an appointment with me. And you book an appointment with me only using scheduling assistant. Only using scheduling assistant. Remember that. Okay, you always book your appointments with me only using scheduling assistant because that tells you when I'm busy and you're not supposed to book appointment with me. Please do so. Okay? <laughs> Since you're the first... <laughs> No, she's gonna, you're gonna, she's gonna, he's going to give it to you soon, so. <laughs> All right. So anyways, the first question comes. You don't need to hold it in your hand. Just be ready for it. When I'm, when I, no, no, no. What I'm saying is, <laughs> yeah, I want to start singing. So yeah, uh, as soon as, uh, as I ask a question, it's your turn to answer. Anyway. All right. So uh, welcome to Object Oriented. I'm going to go through this exactly with the same sequence that it has. I'm going to look at the topics that I feel it's required to be covered in class. I go through it. Many of these things, I don't even talk about it in class. You're responsible to go read it. And when you are coming the next day in lab, you're going to be tested on them. So you have to read all these. Oh, yes, you do. Believe me. The things that you do not understand, I'll talk about in class. OK, all right, the, the rest of them is just English. You have to read and see what does it say, OK, and, and remember. So, so there are certain things that it tells you, like uh, with definitions and things like that, that it's a waste of time. And I read, OK, an integer is a, you can see what it is. If there is, a, if there is something that it needs logic and it needs some um, deep analysis, I'll go through it and I'll explain. Um, so. Uh, we talked about object orientation and why object orientation in this class? No? OK. Why object orientation? Why not uh, just uh, uh, structured programming? The reason behind it, uh, actually, well, you saw the, How many people actually watched the video, the first one? Three people? Four? Shame. OK. So <laughs> seriously, I told you to go watch it because I don't have to explain all these things again. So now I have to do it. So you're going to be one session late. It's OK. That's OK. Uh, so 
Why not structured? Why object oriented? It's because ha that's how, I bra how our brain works. Our brain dictates to us that every single thing that we deal with, every single object that we deal with has some type of functionality. May I touch that pen? Okay, so when I, when I take this in my hand, I know it's not for hitting someone with. This your, it's not for eating food with, okay? This is a pen, its functionality is to write, correct? Right, and it's one of those extractable ones that you can actually bring up, so you know the functionality over here. Each object comes with its own functionality. Does anybody else have it? Has, you have a pen too, right? Or pencil, whatever. So pick it up, please. No, no, just the pen. Just the pen, okay, there you go. So if I push the button over here, you do, don't, you leave it over there. If I push the button and the head comes out, does that head come out? No. But the functionality of these two are identical, correct? This has the same functionality of this one. So pen, pen, out, out. So they work the same way. But when I push this one, the head of this pen comes out, not this one. This is, when I tell you something like this, you say, well, you're, what, are you like wasting my time? Of course, like what, like you're stating the obvious. Like if I, my head becomes itchy, I scratch it. Do you feel that your head is being scratched? No, why? Because I, as an object, have my own head. And he, I'm not gonna hit it, has his own head, right? And each one of us are dealing with that, right? And as you see, although these are beautiful that you both guys had this one, and as you see, they are, these are exactly pens and F, you see they have all the features the other ones have. One is plastic, this one is metal, this one is black, this one is blue and white and gray and yada, yada, yada. So as you see, these two objects are identical objects with different aspects, right? If I want this pen to write, I'll make it ready and I ask it to write for me by doing the action of writing, correct? And I know that it's gonna work. And if I want this pen to write, it will do the same. Now, this pen is black, this pen is blue. When I do the action of writing with this pen, what is gonna be the color? Black. When I do the action with this pen of writing, what's gonna be the color? Why? See, when I say why, everybody knows why. But in C, that's not the case. In C language, you have a function called write. You have to pass the pen as an argument to the function. So two pens cannot write at the same time. One has to wait for the next one to come. Just think about it. Your write function in C must receive a structure pen that has a color attribute, and that write function should go through the structure of pen and see what is the color of the pen to write in that color. I don't need to worry about that in object orientation. In, a, in an object oriented thing, I'm gonna say, hey, write. And because I know it's a writing device, if it's a pen, it's gonna write with black. If it's a brush, it's gonna paint with a brush. They are both writing stuff. They both leave marks. Do we understand if it's, if it's a chalk, it's still the same thing, same category. Or if it's a marker that I'm writing over here on the board, it's the same thing, it's a writing device. To activate, so essentially to make this, I'm gonna give this back to you, I promise, don't worry. So um, <clears throat> to activate this to write, I take its tip off. To activate to this, I push the button. They both have the functionality but they are different in action. So they are both getting ready to write, but in different ways. Do we understand this? Do we understand this? Black, blue. All right, so. A car moves around, right? Car is a vehicle that moves around. An airplane is, an, is a vehicle that 
moves around. They both carry passengers. They take people from A to B, right? So if I tell to a car, if I have a car, and I, say, I, and I ask that car, I'm going to make that car to, to take four passengers from A to B, and I get up an airplane, and I put four passengers in an airplane, and I tell to that airplane to go from A to B, four passengers are gone from A to B, correct? But in different ways. But they are actually, they are actually commuting. It doesn't matter. So the action of commute between these two vehicles are being done differently. Are we okay with that? All right? And um, if a pigeon flies, you've seen a pigeon fly, hopefully, right? Okay, and have you seen a helicopter fly? They both fly. They are both flying objects, correct? But each one of them flies in its own way. So th the action of flying changes shape based on what the object is. But they are both called flying. I do not need to call it a different thing. If a jet airplane flies, it is flying. Of course, it's going to be different with a helicopter or a pigeon or a mosquito. They're all flying objects. But the action of flying is happening in a different way. It changes shape. Do we all agree? Beautiful. Again, as I mentioned in the other class, let's say you're in a country or a place that it, there, has, there is no motorcycles. You have no idea what a motorcycle is. But in that place, you've seen many bicycles. If I come over there to tell you what a motorcycle is, all I need to tell you is, you see this bicycle? Put an engine on it. We call that a motorcycle. Right? So I reuse the shape and action and work of a bicycle to explain or build in your mind what a motorcycle is without actually explaining that it has two wheels. And when you steer, it's going to steer like that. Of course, I have to change the, the actions that they move, the way they move, because when you ride a motorcycle, the way it accelerates is different with a bicycle. A bicycle, you pedal. A motorcycle, you throttle, right? So, I have to mention that the actions, uh, the action of moving between the two are different, but they both move the same way, right? Okay, I just explained to you the full thing about this such, uh, subject to the end of the semester, what you need to know. And these are all, these are, we just label these things. For example, uh, the fact that this pen is black and this pen is blue and they carry their actions with them, and I don't need to pass them to a function to do something, it's called encapsulation. Encapsulation means packing the data and behavior inside a structure. Insta instead of having a structure passed to an action, we put the action inside the structure. So each structure carries its own action. When I have a pen, I don't need to reinvent the writing for this because it's getting it from its definition. They both have those features. And obviously, because they have their own properties, this has color bl black, this has color blue, I don't need to worry that if I write with this one, it's going to go black. No, it's going to be blue because the properties are blue. So the properties, which is its color, the type of ink, how it works, sorry, no, not, yeah, how it works, and, and uh, how do I make it right, become their properties and the action of writing the same. So that's encapsulation, putting the data and behavior inside a package. So each package carries its own behavior. When you are sitting in a car and you, in the car, you push the throttle and the car goes, it's your car that goes, not the other cars. So I'll demonstrate all these things with code in two seconds for you. Don't worry about it, but just first let's understand. So packing, and this is going to be in your quiz, so be, okay? Putting the data and behavior together, putting the functionality and, its, and the attributes of an object together in a structure is called encapsulation. It comes with side effects, uh, good side effects like privacy. We'll, we'll, I'll come to it too, but... <clears throat> um, uh, actually, I can explain it to you right now, and, I, and I'm going to go exactly with the thing that I did in a recording. So if you listen to the recording, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But uh, this gentleman has coffee. I don't have coffee, right? So 
And this gentleman doesn't have coffee too, so him and I will go to the coffee shop to get coffee. Um, and if I don't have money, I'm going to ask him, can I borrow $1.50 to get a coffee? Because I'm his prof, he's hoping that this is going to, in future. <laughs> so he's going so to give me that $1.50, okay? So most probably, right? Or he's going to say, I'm going to get it for you, pay you next time you get it, right? Something like that. So we are all okay with this, right? So this interaction went pretty well. Now, let's rewind. Now, we are going to the coffee shop, and I see that I don't have money. So I'm going to put my hand in his pocket, look for $1.50. Okay, what's going to happen? Slap in the face or fist in the face. Something like, what the heck are you doing, man? Don't touch me, right? What just happened? The privacy was invaded. The private properties of him, that is his money, was being manipulated by an outsider object, which is not correct. This is not right. That's part of object orientation. He has the property that has a value called money, some money he has. I have a property value money that I carry that I have the same. We have different amounts. We have each, well, when I move, my money moves with me. When he moves his money, but I cannot access his money. I have to ask him to give me his money. Got it? That's privacy, the side effect of encapsulation. So in encapsulation, you can actually mention these parts can be touched and these parts cannot. These things can be used and these things cannot. And it happens all the time in real life. Like, um, how many of you actually uh, uh, have ever, ever driven a car? Okay, so if you want the car to stop, what do you do? Hit the brake. Any of you actually got out of the car and went to the brake shoes and tried to push them together to stop them? No. That's what essentially happens. That's the functionality of the car. That's the brake system. So the brake system of the car, there are like two, two, uh, two brake pads that squeezes the disc over there and it stops the car. That's functionality of that. But it's a private functionality. You don't touch it. You access that functionality with your brake because that brake orders four of them in your car. So the private functionalities of your car are not even accessed by you, that is the user of the car. You use them, but indirectly using another functionality. So everything can be private. All of us, we have thoughts. I cannot see what are your thoughts. I have to ask for it. And then you can give me access to it. And that's, that's what it is. So that's part of the privacy that comes with encapsulation. Done. Number two, have doing the same thing in, a, in different shapes, in different ways. Flying, pigeon flying, butter, uh, uh, mosquito flying, butterfly flying, uh, jet flying, I don't know, uh, rocket flies, all these things. These all fly in different ways because the action of flying of, this, of these same objects that are flying objects are done with the same name but in a different way. They have different shapes and that's what we call a polymorphic object. A polymorphic object is an object that does the same thing in different ways. And you don't need to mention it. All you need to do is to tell to a pigeon, fly, and the pigeon is going to fly. Okay? And you tell the helicopter to fly, and the helicopter is going to fly in its own way. So the request for flying is the same, but the type of flying is different. Therefore, these objects have different shapes, although they are from the same family. So doing the same thing in different ways is polymorphism that comes with object orientation. It's in our real, it's in our life. We do it all the time. I write with this, I write with that. The action of writing is the same, but it happens in a completely different way. That goes on a pen, this one goes on a whiteboard. They are both writing, correct? Polymorphism. And finally, to reuse code, to reuse our design. In C language, you reuse your code, you reuse functionality, you create a function, you recall the function over and over and over and over, correct? In C, in C++, we have an object-oriented language, so we don't only reuse function, we reuse design. 
if I have a fully functional bicycle, I'm not going to write the whole code again to create a motorcycle. I simply say, literally in my code, motorcycle is a bicycle, and I add a property engine to it. Then I'm going to go modify all the actions the bicycle did to suit a motorcycle. Therefore, all the design remains to reuse an already existing design and create a new one out of it. We call it inheritance. You inherit all the features and properties of an already existing design and you create a new one out of it. What do we call this design? Anybody knows? Take the microphone. This design that we inherit from, do we know what do you know what do we call it? Pass it. Do you know what does it mean? Is it a class? Thank you. See, you did it. Don't turn it off. Don't turn it off. Don't turn it off. It was it was off? Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> My dear, it's being recorded. It's not being you're not gonna hear yourself. Oh. There's no <laughs> It is working perfectly, it actually. You'll find out when you listen to the recording. Yeah, okay, so it's your turn, sir, now. So it's called classes. These designs, we call them class. Okay? Now, structures are classes. So when I say struct, I mean class. When I say class, I mean class. They are all the same thing. Class, structure, potatoes, potatoes. They are exactly the same. So if you go to an interview and somebody tells you, what is the difference between a class and, and a structure? The question is going to be, which structure? C++ structure or C structure? If it's C++, no difference. They're the same. It's just they have minor differences in privacy that you're going to find out later on. But structure is a class. But if you say, what is the difference between a C class and a C, a C structure and a C++ structure, then you have to say a C class is only a structure that can only contain data, but C++'s structure is a class, it can contain uh, behavior too. You can have behavior and data in it. Are we okay? Are we good? All right. And why? Why object orientation? and not good old C, C language that we had and we work with it comfortably. It's because the projects we do and things that we work on is so complicated that our brain cannot organize it anymore. We need something that matches our pa thought pattern. And our thought pattern is object-oriented because of the, everything that you see in the world. It just comes natural to you. That's why you can organize it easily. And that's why everything goes smooth and nice when you're doing object orientation. With structure language, you can go so much. But with uh, object-oriented languages, you can go the sky is the limit. Because the, the good thing about object orientation is that when you design an object and you're done with it, you forget about it. Because the object knows how it works. The object knows what is its property. The object is going to do everything that it's needed by itself. You don't need to worry about, can I pass this thing to that function? You don't do that. You just simply ask the, the object to do what it's supposed to do. And hopefully, you name your object properly that it makes sense. So if you want to create a class for a student, you're not going to call it an employee. You're going to call it a student. So when you look at the, oh, this is a class student, it represents a student. Done. I don't need to worry about anything. Everything that a student has with respect to your, of your abstraction uh, is in that student. What is abstraction? I pass. <laughs> abstraction? OK, what is abstract art? If he says pass, you're going to answer. So because three passes, it means somebody can come to rescue. OK? So what, do you know what is an abstract art when you say abstract art? No. How about you, lady? You know, my lady? Uh, seriously? OK, my, my friend. What is abstraction? Yes. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm mistaken, but abstraction, it's one of the parts of problem solving. So we. Uh, reducing all redundant information and choosing the most important 
uh, which is like most common one. You can come and teach if you want, because that was perfect. But the thing, but he went just to the point. Okay, so all the bells and whistles that I wanted to go through, I didn't go through. Um, what anybody knows? What is abstract art? You don't know what's up? Abstract art. Is there any other type of painting? <laughs> Is there any? <laughs> It seriously, nobody knows what is abstract art. Like it's the using uh, object shapes and uh, using art inside it, and then like puzzle. Okay, abstract art is the artist's point of view of anything, which means you. Uh, we're going to go to a, to a place that a person does abstract art, and you look at the thing, and you see there is a cone, and it has two branches coming in with two dots on the thing, and you say, what the heck is this? And it says, it's the lady dancing. <laughs> okay? And why? Because that's what the what artist thinks about the lady dancing around. It looks like it's, there's a cone, in the, and it comes up with the own thing. Whatever. What I mean is that it's that artist's view of dancing that they portrait and doesn't make sense to anyone else. We have that one in computer science. When I create a student, depending on what the student is, I have to change the abstraction. If I'm in the OSAP department, I need to know, you know what OSAP is, right? Yeah, if I'm in the OSAP department, that Ontario student loan thingy, okay? So what you care about student is student number and the money that person owes, <laughs> right? When you go to cafeteria and you look at the student class, you want to know what the allergy, food allergies are and how much they have there under one card as credit. If you are going to registration as a student, you need to know which semester the student is, what courses they pass, what is their GPA. So a student, based on which department it's to, is looking at it, becomes a completely different object. And that, as you mentioned, to get what you want and ignore the irrelevant stuff is abstraction in programming. Because without that, we cannot program. It's that uh, endless loop that rookie programmers fall into. See, <clears throat> so it's a, there's a stage of programming. First, you don't know how to program. So you struggle to learn the syntax. That's where you follow what your mentor, professor is telling you, and you just try to implement what they say. Then you to reach to a part that you understand the syntax. Now you can think by yourself. Because now you understand the language, you can translate your needs into that language. When the time comes like that, usually students fall into, or those people who are learning fall into an endless loop. Because when they want to implement things, they go and start designing things that that object has in real world, but it has nothing to do with our needs. And it keeps growing and growing. Do you care that I'm bald? No. You care if I teach properly or not. I'm your teacher. That's abstraction. Abstraction means you take what you want. Do you care if I salsa? No. Right? So that's the thing. You need to, pardon me? Yes, I do. But anyway, so, well, you want to go for it? No. Okay. <laughs> but no, what I'm saying is that, what I'm saying is that, what I'm saying is that it doesn't matter what I do as a professor for you, other than I teach properly, and probably, if, if it's a student, they're going to think, uh, is he an easy marker or not, and things like that. Go to ratemyprofessor.com, you're going to see exactly what is, what is important about a student. <laughs> okay, so that's what I'm saying, okay? So this is abstraction, and because of this abstraction, we're going to need something very important in a department, really important, that means important. In, a, in, 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 in programming. When I am in a, a company, and a company wants to actually deal with a student in many different ways, they're going to be in trouble. Because as we said, 
different parts of the company start creating classes for students, right? What do you think they're going to call the class? Cafeteria wants to deal with the student, they call the class student. Registration wants to create a student, they call a class called student. The OSAP department wants to create this, or HR wants to hire a student as lab monitor, they call the thing student. And they put the whole program together, try to compile it. They have three objects with the same name. They have three classes with the same name. The program's going to fail. Because of this fact, what they did, they created what they call namespaces. So when the, the big boss of programming, the system analyst, the person who's at the top, and have the, the director that is directing the programmers in the company, they say, hey, HR department, you write your code in a namespace called HR. Cafeteria, you call, you write your code in a namespace called food, okay? So what happens when HR department is writing their code, they write namespace, HR, and then they create a student over here. So they say struct, student, student, and what is important for HR? The student number, so unsigned You know what's unsigned int? An integer that is only positive. It cannot be negative. You don't have a negative student number, do you? Okay. Unsigned int, student number, and uh, uh, character uh, work experience. That's what a student is, needs to have, right? And when I go to, when I go to the cafeteria, they write their word, I think, in food, and a struct student has uh, unsigned int student number, and it has uh, double credit. How much credit do they have? And they have character food allergies. All right? Something like that. So the students that we have over here, they're absolutely different with each other. Camel notation. But anyways, they are, uh, but they are both students. And then you go to your main program, and you want to instantiate a student. So now what, I, what I'm with, like, if, if this program wants to deal with HR, what they do over here, yes, sir? Yes, that's, that double dot's called scope resolution. So what you write over here, exactly. So that's what you write over here. You write HR student ST. In C++, you don't need to repeat the struct. When you create a structure, it becomes a type. You don't need to say struct student again to create a student, unlike C. In C, you have to repeat. You don't do that. When you create a structure, it's a structure. So HR creates that one. A student for H, also I'm going to call it HST. That's not the tax. It's a, uh, the human resources student. Actually, let's go camel notation. And then in here, if I want to have for the cafeteria, I'm going to create a student. Then I'm going to call it FST. That's the, the food-related uh, student thingy. Right? Are we OK with this? OK, now, if this main is being written, if this main is being written by the HR department, if this, this is a function that is being written by the HR department, what you need to do over here, because they don't want to keep saying HR, 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 they, what you say, you say using namespace, HR. You do that, then you don't need to, if you don't mention anything, it means HR. Okay? That's how namespaces are done. But you never see such a thing in real life. You never see two namespaces in the same file. That doesn't make sense. OK? Usually, modules are written in a namespace. Individual modules are written in a namespace. And when they added this feature to C++, they said, now what are we going to do with all the 
classes and libraries and things that we have in C++, they don't have any namespace. They say easy. We put them all namespace standard and we call it STD. That's why we write over there using namespace STD. So when I'm actually using, for example, C out or C in, I don't have to say STD scope resolution C out. I just say C out. Okay? So every standard feature of C is in the STD uh, thing. Uh, pass the microphone. Actually, la my lady, you are the next person. Yes. One is using, one is creating. Do you know which school you're in? STDS. That's the name of your school. Okay. For practice, for you to learn, to, to make, to, to create a, a simulated environment for you, we say, because you're students of STDS, all your work is supposed to be in the STDS namespace. So when you are writing your code, you are creating your code, you write namespace, STDS, curly bracket, close curly bracket, you write all your code in there. But in main, when you are using the SDDS, you write using SDDS, and you use the namespace you wrote. Unlike structures and classes, namespaces don't create conflict. If you have two classes with the same name, you have conflict. When you have two namespaces with the same name, they merge and create a bigger bubble. That's why you can have six files with the same namespace when they compile, they merge. Okay? Yeah, they become, the, they become the same. So you can extend the namespace by creating it somewhere else. It simply gets added to the previously existing namespace. Well, when you have two classes with the same name, compiler is going to complain. Okay? Which namespaces prevent that? You can't. You're going to get conflict. <clears throat> For, uh, that's one. And number two, let's say in here in HR I have a struct employee with employee number. Uh, too early. Uh, unsign int uh, employee number and um, character whatever, okay? <laughs> and then in food over here, I have struct, uh, what do I have in food? Uh, restaurant. And the restaurant that I have, it has uh, integer health code, and uh, character menu. Something like this, okay? So, we okay with this? Now, if in your main you use both of this, you say using namespace food then you'll be in trouble if you just say student. Because now it doesn't know which one you're talking about. If you're using employee or restaurant, you're fine. But when you're using student, you have to qualify it. You have to actually say HR. So still, if you have t same thing in two different namespaces and you use them both, there is no conflict. You can resolve the conflict with uh, qualifying the namespace with a scope resolution. This is called a scope resolution. Are we okay? It resolutes the scope. Scope essentially means namespace. Are we good? All right. Okay. So we know all the features of object orientation. We know namespaces. It's all good and nice and dandy. So as you see, I do like this, and I'm going to write A namespaces. So later on, when you are listening to the recording, this is the source code that I have written over there for namespaces. Oh, and that's empty now. So include IO stream in C language. You don't have .h anymore. 
There is, it's, sorry. In C++, you don't have dot .h anymore. OK? So you write include, and you write the IO stream like this. So what if you want to actually use a C header file? Pardon me? Like, it's like a string header file. So what you do, you don't write include string.h. Or if I want, you don't write it. You shouldn't do this. You don't write like stdlib.h. You don't do that. You take the h out, you add a c at the beginning. That means I want the C language standard library. I want C language's string to come in. OK? Are we OK with this? All right. What is a string, madam, in C language? Microphone, please. And you can just pass it to the next person if you're not in a mood. <laughs> what, is a, what is a string in C language? When we say string, what do we mean? It's more than a, more than a character. Uh, pardon me? More than a character. More than a character. Pass it. Which means what? Uh, uh, string is a character array. And, uh, Actually, pass it. Yeah. Perfect. It's a character array that? Combined character array. Like. All the character arrays are combined. Yeah. So string is a character array, which As a non -terminating. has a null terminator. So there is no such a thing as string in C. It's all BS. <laughs> they lied to you. There is no such thing as a string. Following the standard of having a character array and mark the end of data with a null byte, they call that standard string. There is no such thing as string in C language. It's just a character array. Now, if you follow the standard of null termination, we call it C string, so we don't have to keep saying null terminated array of character. Instead, I simply say a string. So when you hear string, I'm saying character array. It has nothing to do with strings. There is no variable called, called string in C language. C language doesn't understand what a statement is. We have functions for it to fake it, OK? Because that's sometimes a problem with, with students. They think that I can, I can have a variable and, and put a name in it. No, you can't. You can't have a variable. You have to create a character array. Then you have to get the damn name character by character and put it in the array and then stick a null termination at the end. Because of that, they created the functions in. So they, they put the built-in thing. They say, if you put percent %s in printf, I'll do that for you. Don't worry. So print, when you do percent, sorry, not in printf, in scanf. When you put a percent %s in scanf, that it does it for you. It reads character by character and puts a null at the end, and so on and so forth. Are we good? That's just a review for, are we good? You're looking at me like, like seriously? <laughs> are you good? All right. So <clears throat> input and output in C language, in C++, is a little bit different. If I don't write that, I have to keep, OK. But anyways. Now I'm trying to find something to give to be able to tell you the, the difference. Uh, it's difficult for me to do. What is the difference between a structure and an object uh, and an instance of an? Oh. Uh, if I say integer i, integer i semicolon, what is the difference between int and i? Go. <laughs> In this int the type. Mm -hmm. It's the instance. Yeah. Correct terminology. Okay, pass it. Okay, so so when I say int i semicolon, int is the type, and i is the instance. Correct. I just told you that in C plus plus, when you say struct, you don't need to write the struct anymore because as soon as you create a struct, it becomes a type. Okay. It's a compound type. 
But nevertheless, it's a type. When I say compound type, what does it mean? When I say pen, OK, everything comes with it. The ink comes with it. The little thingy that open over here comes with it. Just disassemble it and put it back in. OK, and air, all the things, this little thingy, everything comes with it. It's a compound type. It has many things inside, right? It's not only one thing, right? It's not like an atom of something. Everything that we do in real life is a compound type. We don't have primitive types. Rarely you see, I, I can't even give an example of a primitive type in, in real life. In C language, we do have it. We say int i, which means it's a primitive type. There are no pieces and parts. It's just an integer, right? But when I say an employee, that's a compound type which means it comes with this employee number, name, number of children, salaries, yeah, 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 keys. All the things come with an employee. The profession, what does it do? Are we okay with this? Are we okay with this? Yes, yes thank you. I like that. Who said yes like that? Thank you. All right, all right. Okay, so we have two classes. We have a hierarchy of classes, actually, in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, when we, we, we just talked about uh, inheritance, right? So uh, when we are dealing with inheritance, uh, we have a class at the top, OK? That class at the top is called iOS, OK? That is input-output system. That's a class. When I say class, it's a structure. It has functionalities and all the good stuff in it for input and output stuff, right? Then. They inherit that one. They get all the input, output, little thingies that they want, and they put it in two different things, two different classes. OK? They put it in two different classes. Those two classes, ladies and gentlemen, are called iStream and OStream. So this class is called iStream. This class is called O stream. Now, O streams, you know why they call it a stream? Because a stream is something that comes in sequence when you think about it. The water keeps coming in a stream down, and you pick it up, and it keeps coming, something like that. And if you uh, get a hose and you put that water, it goes in a stream, and it keeps going down, right? So they call it a stream because it goes as a stream. So input stream is any device that you can get information from. Any device, anything. For example, keyboard, OK? O stream is any device that you can put information in. Hence, the monitor, the display, right? So what they did, they instantiated these two guys into two objects. So there is an object of time of type O stream, I stream. This and there is an object of type O stream. The object of type I stream, they called it C in. The object of type O stream, they call it C out. The C out object and C in object, they are instantiated in that library. And they, they are globalized for your use which means any place you include I.O. stream, you have access to C in and you have access to C out. Because these are unique objects, they made two instances out of it and they gave it to everyone to use. You don't need to create one because in reality, the computer comes with a keyboard, right? And comes with a monitor and that's what happens. And that's what happens, right? Are we okay with this? You don't need to. Then you have to keep writing STD in front of them because they are in the STD namespace. I'll show it to you in two seconds. So do we understand what C in and C out is? OK. So, and these are polymorphic objects. I'll tell you why. You'll see it in two seconds. OP244 goes very slow at the beginning, OK? So you go uh, little by little, but then we get to the half semester. It's like a thing goes like that. And when we pass through half of the semester, it's going to go with the speed of light. So the information is going to be like that. Just bear in mind 
Okay? These things, the reason is that in object-oriented languages, you, when, as soon as you, can, you build the concept of object, everything becomes easy. And when you understand exactly how an object works, then I don't have to explain all these schmiggly dingies to you. I can just build on what I had before. Therefore, the information flow accelerates. But be ready for it, OK? <clears throat> OK, so for all those, I'm telling you because to all those people that because they see it's coming so slow, they say, ah, it's OK. So they don't study, and they pass the midterm with a with a C and they can say they're gonna say I'm gonna study more and I'm gonna get an A. It that never happens ever. Okay, if you don't start now, half halfway through the semester and then after that almost I've seen like maybe five percent of students who continue they they go well. Okay. Ninety five percent they don't go well. You have to start studying now. Okay. I, what I'm saying is that don't think because it's coming slow it means okay. Keep working on these things hard. Anyway, so are we okay with this? Okay. All right. So, your name, my dear? <laughs> I'm sorry. Why can't I call you? Dumpsy. Dumpsy. Okay. Dumpsy. Okay. Uh, we are, no, 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 what I'm saying is that if I, if I told you my last name is Soli Manlu, it's not as easy for you to pronounce it. So, so it's the same thing. We are, we are all Canadians. Canadians come from all over the world. So, so, so I am not, let see, I am not uh, using the namespace STD. Let's see what happens. If I say over here int main, and I want to use the C out to say hello as I did before, C out, and I'm inserting into C out. I am inserting into C out hello OOP244 ZAA. And, and I'm inserting an end line to it. So you see, I'm inserting stuff into C out. <clears throat> As you see, it's saying, what the heck is this? What the heck is this? Because I didn't use the namespace STD, I have to say STD C out and STD. And L. Now it's okay. But it's going to be painful after a while. So that's why we, we're going to put you. So if I compile and run this program, as you see, C out runs and uh, it, it says hello OP244ZA. And it inserts the new line and the, uh, you see a new line afterwards. Are we okay with this? All right. So not using. STD namespace dot CPP. Okay, but I want to use it, so I'm gonna. I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna come back over here, and instead, I'm I'm gonna say over here using using namespace STD, and I do not need to. I can do put that, but I don't need it. So now I can do this. All right. When I said it's polymorph. So I'm going to do this. Hello to OP244ZAA bar. <laughs> so we are serving drinks over here. OK? So when you get into a bar, the very first thing they do, they check your ID. They're not going to check my ID, but probably they're going to check yours. So what I'm saying is that I've got to check your ID to see, the, see if you're above 19 so you can actually drink over. So to be polite, first they, they ask for your name. So how do we create? Now I'm going to refer it properly from now on. We're not going to call it string anymore. We call it C string. Because in C++, there is a class called string that encapsulates all the thing a C string is supposed to do. So we're not going to use that in this semester, unless in two occasions. Strings comes in; they come in three, four, five. We still want you to struggle with uh, character point, character arrays, and pointers and stuff like that, and learn how to deal with them. That's why we are not introducing. We want you to be strong in it. So <clears throat> I'm going to create a C string. So from now on, I'm going to say C string, not a string. Okay? So I'm going to create a C string called name over here. Okay? Uh, let's put, I don't know, um, 80 characters for it. So that's name. And we need to know what the age is. So 
There is a new type in C++ called size t. Size t is essentially an unsigned integer. Anything that is supposed to be measuring size that cannot go negative, you can do size t. So I'm going to put size t h. Oh, what the devil was that? No idea. Uh, so h. All right? So I have name and I have h. Are you okay with this? Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to say c out. Uh, may I have your name? And then I'm going to go to new line, insert new line, and I'm going to show a prompt so the user can actually enter the thing. Are we okay with this? May I have your name? Now I want to extract the name from console. Do I need to care if it's string or integer or whatever? No because the action of extraction is polymorph. It knows by itself. When I say to pigeon to fly, I don't have to mention how. Pigeon flies like this, right? And if I told the jet airplane to fly, it flies in its own way. So all I need to do over here is to say, see in, extract the name, done. It knows it's a string, it's gonna get a string, no worries. Insertion operator? This one? I'm just trying to be clean and nice. That's all. I just want to show something nice. You'll see. So in here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to write over here, uh, C out. And I'm going to say, again, insert. I'm going to say, uh, hello again, name. I don't need to, I'm just inserting. I don't need to do any formatting or anything. Uh, how old are you? I'm going to go to new line and show a prompt. Don't worry, you'll see it soon in two seconds. OK? Now I'm going to get the age. How do I get the age? Exactly how I got that name. It's a polymorphic action. So I simply say C in age. It knows it's a size T, it's an integer. It's going to ask for an integer. Got it? And then after it's done, I can write my if statement. If age is greater than or equal to 19, I can actually say, welcome. How may I serve you? Okay, and the story continues. I'm not going to go after that, asking for drinks and stuff like that. Okay, else, see out, I'm going to say name, get out of here and come back when you grow up. Okay, grow up. And then I was in security. Okay, I'm not gonna do that. Okay, all right. So, and I'm gonna go to new line. So let's yes. Couple. Okay. <clears throat> May I have the couple of question stick? Where's the stick? Okay. There you go. Here you are. <laughs> sure. Okay. Um. First off, the data type for the age. Mm -hmm. So size T. Yeah, you did make mention of something earlier. When you were explaining, you said um, unsigned int, it helps us to... Unsigned int is IPC 144. Yeah, so... It's the same. It says with this, uh, a negative number cannot be entered. No. Right. When you enter a negative number, it's going to read something positive. You, did, okay, you got that in IPC 144, right? 19 gives 19 and all this. Okay. Uh, I cannot draw it. Actually, I can. Oh, I don't have my schmiggly dinghy. Otherwise, uh, maybe I can. Let me see if I can draw. Maybe I can draw. Give me a second. Uh, there you go. So <clears throat> when you are dealing with signed integers, you have a zero, right? And then the zero goes to positive numbers. 
and reaches to its limit, correct? Whatever the limit is. If it's a character, it's 127. If it's a short integer, it's 32,000 something. It is a limit, binary, okay? And if you go, so this is the positive part, right? If I go to negative, it reaches to a limit. If it's a character, it's minus 128. If I go minus 129, it becomes 127 positive. That's how it works. So if I eliminate the sign, all I have this th is this. I have the variable, and it goes all the way positive. Correct? If you put anything negative, what's going to happen? It becomes a big positive number. That's how it works. So okay, that's so that's unsigned integer that is C. Therefore, it works in C++. It's a primitive type. They were sick and tired of typing unsigned this, unsigned that. They created a new type called size T that does the same thing. Yes, okay. but wouldn't that make our program um, act a certain kind of way? Or are we going to include an if statement at the end? For example, you ask this person's age and... Accidentally put negative number. Yeah, negative yeah it's going to cause trouble. Exactly. So, so anytime we use... I'm arguments. not trying to write the most efficient program. <laughs> You're absolutely right. If it was a foolproof program, then I'll show you how to write a foolproof program using CN's capabilities. Okay, but for now, I'm just giving, because I want to teach you new stuff, okay. uh, but you're absolutely right. If somebody enters minus something, we'll be in trouble, which is very easy to catch using CIN. CIN has the capability to look, but don't touch. CIN has the capability to look, but don't touch, which means you can tell to CIN, hey, do you see a negative? Don't touch it. Do you see a negative? If CN says yes, before even reading it, you're going to tell to the user why you're entering negative numbers. Don't. We did before even reading it. And you're going to flush everything, psh, gone. And you start reading again. So there is a pass. It, with our knowledge, it's not. But wait for it, it comes up. Okay. That was the first question. The second. I think every, with the changes you've made now, I think you've... Oh, answered. it's clear? Because okay. I wanted to ask about the size... On the school, see, as it well, all so you have to for that um, back to IPC one four four. Look at the number of bits to the two to the power of bits. That's the number of maximum number of positive two to the power of bits divided by two plus one. That's minus negative, and uh, minus one is uh, positive. Okay. Thank you. Um, so you said C out and C in they are objects, right? Mm -hmm. But when you write C out to free now, like something, is it also a function? Are you an object? Hmm? Are you an object? Yes, I am an object. Are you talking? I am talking. Is talking a function? Yes. Whose function is it? My function. So when you talk, your voice comes out, correct? Yeah. She has the same thing. She can talk. Talk. Okay. And her voice comes out, correct? It's the same thing with C in. C in has its functionalities. So you cannot say is it an object but also a function. It's an object. An object can do things. Okay. Every object has functionalities. Yeah, but when you write like C out something, do you, do you kind of, you know, like activate one of the functions inside? Like oh, oh, yes. Inside yes, exactly. Like, yeah, so I was wondering uh, when using the function, can you write like a similar object? That has a function that you use insertion and uh, extraction. Because they usually. Yes, that's called. Oh, that deep breath, that's halfway through the semester. In C, you can do anything. You can make anything look. You can make plus do minus for you. You can do multiplication, do printing for you. You can redefine everything. That's the whole idea of polymorphism. So, yes, the answer is yes. Yeah, no, You are using, right? you are using parameters. Yeah, I'm just not like familiar with the insertion and, you know, like the sequence of insertion and extraction. It's a little bit different. I'm like just... Use parameters, you use just like parentheses, not like that. You know. That's what I'm saying. It's object-oriented. Have you ever added two numbers? 
Did you use parentheses for it? Ta-da! It's an operator. You have a left operand, you have a right operand. Have you ever used equal sign? Did you write i is equal to 3? What does that do? It inserts 3 into i, correct? OK. This ins Wait for it. It comes up. We're going we're gonna to talk about it like in, in three weeks, OK? Three, four weeks. It's called operator overloading, FYI. We're going to come to it soon. And thank you for the, uh, the thank you, being up for, uh, to the gentleman. No, 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 so you can pass it to the lady beside you. Why are you passing all the way through? OK, you had it. OK, that's fine. All right. Huh? End line means end line. Oh, let me run it. I want to run it. Can I run this, please? OK. <clears throat> OK, let's run it. Let's run it. Let's run it. Let's run it. OK, F10 does magic. So you press F10, it goes step by step, and it, and it keeps going. Did I mute anything? Or no, no, I didn't. Is it recording? Yes. So I'm going to press F10. And ta it's at the first line. So I'm running it step by step. I'm putting it this one at left and putting this one at right. Now I'm going to go step by step. Let me just move it a little to right so uh, we can see better. So it comes over here. It inserts this into C out and then an end line. Therefore, it's not hello, it's hello. You see this cursor is here? That's end L working, going to new line. Now it's going to do another C out. And as you see, unlike C language, old C language, you can define your variables after executable stuff, which is not a good thing. You shouldn't do that. OK, it's a bad, it's a bad style. OK, I just did it by mistake, and, and I'm just going around with it. I'm going to bring it up after the execution is over. All right? So usually you create all your variables at the beginning of the block. Any open curly bracket, you can start your variables. In C, C++, they're all the same. OK, so then I'm going to go like that. Now, it's, you see this prompt thingy? That's what you were asking, what is that? I've just created a prompt so we know what we are. So it says, may I have no name? Now C in wants to extract a name from keyboard that is character string. And it will do it. So it waits over here. And I'm going to say over here, Fred. And I hit Enter. So as you see, name now contains Fred in it. It's a null terminated array of characters, which is a C string. Now it's going to say, hello again, Fred. How old are you? Right? Because it says hello again and inserts name and inserts that one. And if you ever are worried what does that mean, it's exactly like you are doing something like A is equal to B plus C plus D. You see I can keep adding like that. It's the same thing. I keep adding to the values. It's, it's just, per, it's just operands of the operator, that's all. So now it's going to say C into H because it's an unsigned integer. It will receive an unsigned integer. So as soon as I uh, execute it, it's going to wait for it to enter. And I'm going to say over here 15. And it's going to hit enter. Age is 15. This is 19. I highlight them. And now it's going to say it is false. So that's how you walk through your stuff to see if they are working properly or not. So now it's false. It Pardon me? Look at this. Debug. Debug. Ta-da. So F10 is step over. F11 is step into. Shift F11 is step out. So step into is when you are reaching to a function. You want to go inside the function and walk through. F10 steps over, so if you reach to a function, it executes the whole thing and passes it. Step out is you go to into a function, and the function is too long. You know it works. You want to get out. Shift F11, it jumps out. So all these things. Take a look at all these shortcuts. It's good for your health. Believe me. All right? Are you pressing F10 every time? F yes, every time it executes one statement. OK? So now it jumps to, now it jumps to else, and it's going to print. Fred, get out of here and come back when you grow up. Are we OK? All right. So now we use C in and C out. And let's clean up. There. Oh. 
Okay, first I have to type something, then I have to clean up. Clear all. What's going on? <laughs> I'm sorry, something is happening in here. Okay, so, and clear all. There you go. I just want to get rid of those things from on the screen. Okay. And then return zero, uh, returns at the end, and we're done. Are we okay with this? That's how you walk through your stuff. Remember I told you today when you come over here, to have your coffee and stuff because I'm not going to give you a break. Okay, I'm not going to give you a break. We're going to go right to the end. We don't have much time, so the, at the beginning of the semester, please come awaken to the class, okay, with coffee and stuff. All right, so that's that. Uh, so, and you can stop the execution halfway through or you can just run it. If you just say continue, it ends everything and tells you how the program stopped, or you can just click stop and stops the execution. Are we okay with this? All right. A quick demonstration on what's the time? Nine thirty nine twenty-three. I will do that later. We'll do that later. So this one is IO C uh, IO stream. So I'm gonna call it uh, C IO stream dot CPP IO stream intro. Dot CPP. Okay. Obviously, it's not as easy as you go through. Like if I actually run the program, Control F5 runs without debugging. Control F5 runs without debugging. May I have your name? I'm going to write over here Fred Soleil, and it's going to hit the fan. It's not going to work because a delimiter for a C string is white space. So it reads Fred and puts it in CN, in name. And then when it comes to age, it wants to read Soleil. It cannot. And CN is very shy. CN and C out there are very shy objects. You do something wrong, they don't understand, they won't talk to you anymore. You have to apologize. So if something goes wrong, you're going to ask, hey, CN, are you OK? You feel good? It says no. You're going to say, apologize. Apologize is clear. So say CN.clear. Then you tell to see and ignore or whatever garbage is in there. Literally, these are the function names. Clear and then ignore. Okay? Ignore and then you do it again. So that becomes, we'll, talk, we'll come into foolproofing and stuff soon. Okay? So again, because these are objects, it's not like thing that you have to check to see if the value is yada yada. Those are values, but, but to check the validity of reading and writing and stuff like that, if things are read correctly, you talk to the object. You ask the object if you actually read successfully or not. Okay? But if, it's, if you are reading an integer, an integer is entered, Let's say it's someone's age and somebody and 900 seen won't understand that. 900 is very good integer, right? So that you have to write program for. But if you say, what is your name? Somebody write T-E-N as 10, then seen won't understand. Then you have to actually, then, it, then it's going to actually be not talking to you and you have to do the clear thing. So validation for the entry can be done using CN. How the compiler works. It is actually a very important thing we need to know. And how it works is as follows. And the interesting thing is that I talk about this at the beginning of IPC 144, OOP 244, and still I have to talk about it in OOP 345. For some reason, people forget. So, so I'm going to talk about it today. Uh, please pay attention. Okay, and uh, let's see if I, I can actually, yeah, copy and paste it in today's lecture. I just want to put it so you have the picture at home if you are uh, pulling the repository. You always pull the notes repository and all the things that I have written will come through, right? So, oops.
There you go. I'm, I'm just, uh, you don't see it on the other picture. I'm putting it in a repository paste. <clears throat> How does a compiler work? <clears throat> how does a compiler work? <laughs> He's ready for all the answers. I can tell you how it works. I know, but, but, but we're going to go through. <clears throat> so this is how the compiler works. This, what you see right now, is when on your, so let's say the name of this, are we out of time? No, 9.45 it ends, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we have lots of time. I see lots of people walking around. I thought maybe I'm making a boo-boo or something. <clears throat> so... Let's say the name of this file is 1.cpp. This is 2.cpp, this is 3.cpp, and this is 4.cpp. I have four files, OK? So this is as if on matrix, this is as if on matrix, this is as if on matrix you write something like this. C++, I, it, it make it a little bigger. Is writing C++, 1.cpp, 2.cpp, 3.cpp, 4.cpp, and you hit enter. OK? This is what it looks like. And the outcome is A dot out. You know that, right? Which means it uh, gives you the executable. You've done this on matrix with C language, right? 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 No. Right? Right? <laughs> he doesn't want to acknowledge. Right. OK, so that's, so <clears throat> how does it work? We think that compiler runs in one shot. That's not reality. When you write that thing, how many arguments you are passing to C++ command over there? Four. So five applications are going to run when you do that. So when you put four, five things. Four times the compiler is going to run, and one time a linker. OK? So for 1.cpp, separately, without knowing anything exists, compiler only runs for this and creates an object file for it, one.object. Then goes to the second one, runs only second one, and creates two dot object. Then compiles on the third one, three dot object, compiles on fourth one, four dot object. Then one dot object, two dot object, three dot object, four dot object, go to a program called linker. The linker puts them together, makes sure all the promises you made, you kept, creates an executable of it, out of it if possible. And then you run it, you see it doesn't work, <laughs> you go back up, you change 1.cpp to that, and then that story continues. OK? So when you run something in four times like that, not aware. So compiler, when you are writing 1.cpp, is not aware that 2.cpp exists. And in this case, when you are writing, running 3.cpp, it doesn't know that 2.cpp exists. Op but you are in 3.cpp using some functions of 2.cpp because you included its header file. So in 3.cpp, 3.h is included. Pardon me? Did I say, did I say 2.h? 2.h. So in 3.cpp, 2.h is included. OK? So when you compile this, what the compiler sees and compiles is this, ladies and gentlemen. Let me put something like dark blue. This is what the compiler compiles and sees. Actually, sorry, this is what the compiler compiles. It doesn't know that 2.cpp even exists. What does it mean? In the header file, in C language, you add prototypes for functions, right? So essentially, introduce your functions to the files, correct? So when you are compiling in 3.cpp, you call the function from 2.cpp. 
the action of calling will be compiled because the compiler knows how to call it because of the header file. But if actually the function exists, compiler has no idea. That's why you can just create a, create a function, prototype, write a code based on a prototype, and only compile it, and it compiles successfully. But as soon as you want to link it and make the executable, then the linker checks. You called a function from 2.cpp. Is the function actually there? If it's there, then the executable is created. So when you see a message comes, function yada, 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 called in this module or in this file does not exist or cannot find an external reference to it, that's the linker telling you that you screwed up. Right? You follow? And that's how the compiler works. This is something that we need to understand. So promises made, promises kept. Linker checks that one. It's as if I tell you, right out of that thing in that classroom, there is a tutor that is going to help you throughout the whole semester. You go over there. It's going to be amazing. It's going to 24 hour. Anytime you go, the person is going to help you. I made a promise. You go over there, no one's there. OK, so promise made is good. It makes you happy. That's the compiler. But actually, the thing exists or not, that's a different story. OK? Do we understand how the compiler works now? And that's why we do it like this, because if you put them all in one file, it becomes so big, the compiler cannot compile. Like, I remember that we went, like, uh, several years ago, we were working on uh, a product called OpenOffice. Now it's called Office Libre and stuff like that. It's an op open source office like Microsoft Office, but it was like that. And at the time, it used to take around 10 hours for it to compile on a normal computer. 10 hours to compile. The number of things in where it was the way to build it from zero to up, it would take 10 hours for the first time. Then, of course, you change only one thing, then it wouldn't go through it. It would only take 30 minutes. But it, it was like that. It's crazy. So imagine if you make them all in one file. <laughs> it's impossible. The compiler doesn't have the capacity to do it, right? So that's how the compiler works. Bear that in mind, please. And that's why you have the workshop to be able to remember how you did modules in C. Workshop one tells you exactly how to do it. Put this function here, put this function there. Number two, we are just seeing how you did in IPC 144. So just create one. You can use anything you want in it. Use C libraries if you know how to do C++. Use C++. It doesn't matter. Accomplish it with sub modules and, and submit it. I want to see how you do it. OK? It's just functions, writing a very simple program in it. And that's that. Uh, questions? Questions? Pardon me? I, I went on it together in its text. Read it. If you have any problem, contact me. OK? That's why we do it. it. It's a waste of time if I open it up and start reading it for you. OK? You read it, come to me, or either book an appointment, or if it takes time, when you're coming to lab, that's when you're going to ask. Far that I read it, I didn't understand this part and that part. OK? Uh, it's very important we understand that this is, and, and the higher semesters you go, the least you're going to be, it's, it's going to be a talk about your homeworks. Because that's how real life works, right? If you go to a company, they tell you, this is your task. Go do it. They go say, can you go over it to me? They, they don't. Because, you know, that's how it is. IPC, they, they take you through it. In OP, we give it to you with description. You read it. Then you come to us, OK? Then, uh, and I'll help you in any way you want. Booking appointments are the most uh, the easiest way because we are one-to-one, -one, especially when you write something uh, and you put it. Remember, you book an appointment and you have a problem with coding, you always push it to your Git repository, you send me the link in your appointment request description. So immediately, as soon as the appointment starts, I open up your repository and I take your code and I'll fix it right in front of you. And what was your obligation on that? Reflect. Okay? That is good that you remember. 
Uh, we have a few minutes. So <clears throat> let's go back to that bar program thingy that we have written. I think we did this already. So you said this bar program that we have written. So now I want to create my student. Now I want to create my student. So what I will do over here, I'm going to say, <clears throat> so not a student. Uh, actually, it's a bar. So the person is not a student. It's a customer, right? So I'm going to create a struct. So first, namespace SDDS, follow the rules. Any code we write is going to be in a namespace SDS. And obviously, when you are actually doing it, it's going to be in a customer that CPP separated with the header file. <clears throat> but we are not doing it because we don't know yet how. I just, I'm just giving you a taste of what the OOP programming is, OK? Just a quick taste in next seven minutes. So I'm creating a struct, customer, OK? And for my thing, I need their name and age. That's all I need to have, right? So I'll go character name. That's my encapsulation of a customer for this program. So I'm going to have a name. I'll put over there, let's say, 80 characters. <clears throat> and I'm going to have an, an age for it. Following yours, I'm going to put integer so you're happy. OK? Age. <clears throat> the difference is that because now these are not regular variables, they are member variables member of an object, member of a class. Because of that, it's the uh, coding style rule in OOP244. When you create a member variable, you start the name with M underline. Why? Because the sky is high. That's the rule that I am giving to you. So you have to do that. No questions asked. Why? I may explain it to you later on or may not. This is how programming works. They give you, a, as I told you, a 3,000-page documentation on coding style wherever you get hired. And you have to follow that when you are coding. You cannot use your own taste. It doesn't work that way. OK? But that's what it is. So M customer and MH for member. Now, <clears throat> I want to know if this customer is legal. Or let's do it something else. Let's say I want to get the customer name, right? I want to get the customer name. If I wanted to write it in C, I would have written it over here like this. Void get customer name. <clears throat> and I passed over here struct pointer as, so, uh, struct, not struct, customer, because we don't need to have it C++ customer pointer C. And I pass the customer and I set it, right? I don't do that anymore. <clears throat> because customer is now a class, in here I simply say void get name. Whose name? Of course, the customer's name. I am in customer. I'm going to say customer, get name. Customer object. Or I could say set name. Actually, set name is better. <clears throat> because I'm setting the name of the customer, right? Set the name. How do I set the customer name? See out name, C in M name, right? Or I can just put a prompt like that. Correct? Right? That's how I get the name, don't I? Why I don't need to say whose name? Because I know where my head is as an object. I know where my hands are. My hands are mine. When you are in a customer, every single functionality of customer knows where name is. It's part of its property. It knows it. Got it? Yes, exactly. So if I want to show <coughs> the uh, customer name, uh, what I need to do over here is to have uh, do I need to, let's say I want to get the customer's name. I want to ask someone's name. Uh, 
I asked her name, she gave it to me. I'm going to ask that customer's name. So I'm going to say over here, get name. But when I'm getting the name, I have to pass the name out, correct? That's character pointer, correct? But I don't want them to change it. So I'm going to pass a constant character pointer. So I'm giving out securely so they cannot change it. Now in here, I'm going to say return M name. Right? I want to know if the customer has a legal age for drinking. What do I do? I'm going to say over here legal. Is the customer legal? And it's either yes or no, correct? That's a new type in C++ called bull. Either true or false. Any condition can be true or false. I could have returned an integer like C. Still works. All the things you had in C, it works. But this is more understandable. When I say Boolean, it means either true or false and nothing other than that. And what is the legality? Like, how do I, how do I actually check to see if it's legal or not? Okay, I can say Boolean, Boolean result, and I'm going to say false. Then I'm going to say if age, because I know my age, I am in here. If the age is greater than or equal to 19, then result is true. Correct? Obviously, I'm going to always follow the standards and also go learn how to type. Falsely, that's false. Okay, so there you go. And at the end, I'm going to say return result. So I don't need to write an if statement to check to see if it, if I move this customer to Quebec, I'm going to change that 19 to 18. <laughs> right? Pardon me? I don't have the name? Here you go. I'm going to have it. It's as easy as this. Void set age. See out. Now I have it. Whenever I need it, I have it. That's wrong. I have one minute. I'm going to continue this the next day. C in M H. So anything I want the customer to, to, to do, I'll do it. So my program main doesn't have to think about it. If I'm supposed to have a car, I want the car to move. If the car is electric, it's going to move with a battery. If the car is ice car, is an internal combustion engine car, then it has to work with the gas. I'm not going to bother the driver to know that. I'm just going to put a throttle. All you need to do is to push the throttle. It's going to go. How? You don't care. It's the same thing over here. If I want this thing to be legal, so I'm going to do actually what happens over here at the top in here. I'm going to say constant uh, integer legal age. And I'm going to set that one to 19. So in here, I'm going to just take that one and put the legal age over here. And whoever wants to compile my program, if you take it to US that is 21, you change that to 21. If you want to do, do in Quebec, you change that to 18. My class is going to work properly. You don't need to worry about how the legal age is calculated. Just give it the initial things and it works. OK? We're going to talk about the rest the next day. So this is incomplete. So I'm going to say incomplete over here. Incomplete. Uh, we'll talk about it in the lab. As I mentioned at the beginning of the semester, because we are uh, behind, we're going to use some of the lab for the lecture. Make sure you don't miss it. Okay? All right. Thank you. Have a beautiful day.